everyone, it's Tasha Daniels here, two-time Olympian and Olympic bronze medalist, and you're watching another episode of Global Sports Channel's Sports Personality Spotlight. Now, my next guest stands at six foot five, 260 pounds. For, for you Europeans, that's 118 kilos of muscle, which really helped him in the career path he chose. I'm not going to say anything else. I'm going to let him tell you his story. Welcome, James Hoyle. James, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm excellent, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. How have you been? Yeah, not too bad uh, in this uh, strange old world. But yeah, look, going okay. Can't complain at the moment. But uh, yeah, look, enjoying uh, enjoying my time post, um, I guess, post my career and um, yeah, enjoying doing different things. But yeah, currently based in London. Uh, so in, in lockdown here currently. Yeah. which uh, which isn't much fun but you know that's uh, in the, as i said in the scheme of things it's not too bad it's the, yeah definitely the world we live in my mum is is yeah. from jamaica but she's in london at the moment and it's like very difficult for someone <laughs> like yourself someone like my mum to be kind of locked in in that way so hopefully things start changing soon that would be great now i was wondering like someone like you with such and, and just so you know i'm going to tell you this up front Everything I know about rugby, I've pretty much learned from studying up on you. So if I say something crazy, just just give me a slap on the hand. Right? But your stature, you're a big, you're a big guy. Were you always, you know, big for your age, or did you kind of grow into that? Um, a little bit of both. I, I guess I was always quite a big kid, um, and I, uh, I guess that's probably what suited me to playing rugby. I, um, I. You know, I used to play a lot of different sports growing up as a kid. Um, you know, growing up in Australia, it was sort of what you did. You know, you know, every every afternoon after school, you were playing a different sport, and you know, on weekends, you'd play one sport on a Saturday and another sport on a Sunday, and that was it. And even some sometimes on the same day, you'd, you know, I'd, I'd have my parents, you know, shipping us across town to, um, you know, from one sport to the next. So, yeah, I guess I was always quite big, um, but yeah. I get probably more in the the other direction than height um, when I was yeah. a bit younger, and then uh, <laughs> as I got a bit older, I sort of uh, shot up a bit, and you know the height came sort of you know into my teenage years. But uh, yeah, I, I guess as as a in general answering to your question, I was probably one of the quite a big kid as I, as I grew up. Now you mentioned that you you were a big kid that you played some other <laughs> sports. But you actually had to be convinced to really get into rugby as a teenager. What was it that was kind of keeping you deterred from from really diving in? Uh, well, I think it's just what you know. You know, I, I used to play um, AFL or Australian Rules Football for for the international audience, which is a it's a game that's played only in only in Australia. And I grew up playing that. Uh, and I, I just used a lot. That's what I like to do. And as a you know, I guess as a kid when you you know when your parents say you should change it was um you know I, I it was probably more suited to the school i went to so i went to a private school um gotcha. in brisbane where where rugby was was a big sport and as i said my, my body shape probably suited a little bit more to play rugby than it does um than what the afl did so look it that was probably the the big thing but yeah there was obviously a um What's the what's the probably the right word? A bit of a hesitance to to try and dive into it. Um, but once I did, once I did, uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed it. I loved it, and it um, you know it allowed me to do what I've been able to do today. Now I've I've watched a couple of clips rugby. I've seen it in the past, even though I like never really looked deeply into it. I've seen it in the past, and I've always thought to myself. You've got to be nuts to play this game. So much physical contact. Am I right? Do you have to kind of be a little bit brave, a little bit courageous to play such a physical sport? Um, well, look, I think you, the physicality part is that is a big part of the game. So yeah. you need to have an acceptance that that's going to be part of what you do. So right. uh, if you're not ready to accept that, then you rugby's probably not the right game for you. Look, I, I don't know if we're crazy or not. It's just. <laughs> For, as I said, that's what that's what we did, and that's what we grew up doing, and it was just an acceptance that that's that's the game, um, yeah. you know. And the game's you know very physical at the moment. It's um, you know continually um, you know changing as as it evolves, and everyone's getting bigger. 
uh, bigger and stronger and faster as, as the world as everyone develops. So look, it's um, yeah, but it's a it's a great game and something I've um, you know I was very lucky to be a part of. Right now, you you played over two hundred and fifty professional games. You had sixty one caps. You've been team captain. Played in the World Cup. Must have been pretty special though to be born in Queensland and then play for the Queensland Reds. Yeah, look, that was probably, you know, I guess it's one of those things that, you you know, you play for your sort of childhood club to an, to a set, to an extent and, um, yeah, being a proud Queenslander and I guess for those that know Australia or know um, about the state system in Australia, we're... Um, we're uh, we're a very parochial bunch, uh, and you know you're very proud of where you're from. So, you know, I was um, lucky enough to be able to play for you know ten years at, at the Reds and captain them for a long period of time. So that was um, certainly something that I was uh, very excited about, and um, you know, very lucky to be able to do it for so long. Right. You actually played. Excuse me. You actually played uh, for your first Australian national rugby team when you were 21. And that, you know, that's a really young age to, to really be coming out in such a way. But something that stood out to me when I was looking at your career was that you said that Greek said something to you that really stood out when you played that first match. And that's a message that you've passed on to other players since. Do you remember what that was? Yeah, look, I think it was always something that about test match rugby, you know, which is obviously the pinnacle of the sport. And um you know, he, I, I just remember he always said, "Look, it's the, it's just another game. It just everything happens a little bit faster." And I think that's sort of something that uh, I always think it's you know quite good to pass on to the guys to to sort of relax them. It, it certainly relaxed me um, when I was when I was going out to play. As you're, um, you know, as you're obviously very nervous. It's your first opportunity to sort of represent your country on a on a global scale like that. And um, yeah, I think it's you know. It, while you know there's the professionalism of the game and everything sort of out and you know there's a high intensity and high stakes it, in the end it is another another game of rugby and um you know you i always sort of tried to convince guys coming through that they deserve their chance to get there by playing the game so they um that's what they should focus on and not worry about the the enormity of the occasion right did you over time develop strategies uh, that helped you deal with, you know, the bigger events, even for myself being in smaller championships than going to the Olympics. I had to come up with a mental strategy to to really play. Was it that one comment that really made a difference for you or did you have other things that you would do to help keep yourself mentally able to manage some of the bigger games? Uh, look, I think for me, a lot of it's about the process. Um, you know, in the week leading up, it was always about, trying to keep the process consistent regardless of the game. And I think that process allowed you to give that confidence and that belief in what you're doing. I think, you know, when the when the process and the week and, you know, as as all athletes know, routine is is something that's, you know, quite um, you know, quite near and dear to what to what we do. Or for me anyway, it was, you know, a very routine based sort of person. I always did the same things and always tried to sort of go through the same process day by day. And that for me was um, was always important. I think, you know, when you go through the process to get to the the end result, the you know, I always felt that the the result would look after itself once the process was correct. And, you know, it, it was then just about getting yourself prepared, mentally prepared for that game. And by the through that process, I, I found that I would mentally prepare myself for the for the the game, regardless of whether it was a a club game, you know, played on a Thursday night or a test match in front of 100,000 people. Right. Now, you you played the lock position. Tell, tell for people who've never, you know, watched rugby or don't really understand it as much, what's the responsibilities of someone in your position? Um, yeah, look, I mean, depends on who you ask. You probably, if you ask a bunch of locks, it <laughs> will tell right. you we're the most important people in the team. But uh, if you ask, you know, a, a bunch of others, we're probably uh, people that just get in the way all the time. Uh, look, I think the lock, we're, we're I think you, we sort of consider ourselves the engine room or the, or, of, a, of, a, of a team. We're sort of in the, when you're looking at the scrum, we're in the second row, which is the other name for the, for the lock. It's called a second row. You know, for, for no other reason that you you are in the second row of the scrum, um, and I guess a big part of what we do is you know go around and, and get through all the 
probably the non-glory stuff. You know, we make make a lot of carries, do a lot of tackles. Um, you know, the line out where the, the players get lifted in the air. Traditionally, the locks are the are the tall guys of your team. Um, so you do a lot of the aerial work, uh, jumping in the line outs and so forth. And yeah, the, the the positions probably evolved a little bit over time where you're expected to be, you know, there's a lot more athletic guys out there now that are doing different things. But yeah, in plain and simple, we uh, we make sure we hold on to the ball so that the, the fast guys and the, the guys with the good footwork can uh, can do what they need to do. Right. Well, speaking of important people on the team, you've actually been captain for the Wallabies and you've also been captain for the Queensland Reds. What do you think it takes to make a great captain? Uh, well, I think, first of all, it, it's about the respect of the people that you're leading. I think that's, um, you know, the respect and trust is really important. You know, you can't ask someone to, you're not going to expect someone to follow you unless they respect or trust what, you, what you're going to say. And I think that's it. That's important. And sometimes um, that takes a while to, to happen um, and, and can take some time. So, I, you know, I think that was always something that was important to me as a, as a leader that, you know, while it's you're not, uh, you might not always sort of be liked in in the sense um, by some people. That, you know, you got to make sure that you're respected, and that was that's the important part for me. And if they're respected, then you know, and, and that's a mutual respect, you know, both ways for you and the, and the people that you you need to lead. It's um, I think it it becomes a successful relationship. Right now, you led the Wallabies when you were playing against, you know, big matches against teams like the Lions. Did you feel an additional pressure when you were captain for games like that? You know, the, the responsibility of such a big game? Uh, I think the the responsibility is there when, you, when you're the captain of a, of a national side, particularly in the, you know, the Australian side, that, you know, there's an expectation that from the, from the supporters and the public that, the you know Australian national teams are designed to win, and that you know that's uh, that's something that's not really needed to be spoken about. It's just an understanding that you know the national team, um, you know, no matter what the sport is, um, you know, the, the number one thing is you've, you're expected to win and be successful. Um, so, you know, maybe that was magnitude like magnified a little bit due to the increase of uh, exposure for for bigger games, but in the end, it was. Every time I took the field, um, you know, as, a, as captain or, or I had the responsibility of uh, being captain of, of a team, it was, you know, I felt that it was, you know, I needed to do the jersey and the people that support that team justice. Because, and, you know, we had to make sure we live up to their expectations. And not all the time did we win, but it was about making sure we, you know, we got, we, we did them proud. And, and that was that was important to me. Right. I'm glad you mentioned that because when you're in the lead up to a <clears throat> a game, oftentimes the atmosphere in the town changes, uh, the crowd can affect, you know, how team team players feel. What was it like for you, like you said, having that responsibility to make the people proud? What What's the whole atmosphere like and how does it how do you think it affects players? What's going on in the town? What's going on in the stadium at games? Yeah, look, I think it's a, you know, it's a big part of um, international sport, um, you know, part of rugby. We're very lucky. We used to travel all over the world, uh, particularly for the Wallabies, and you play in some great places and see some great stadiums and, and some unique cultures uh, and unique supporters. And, and I think that's a, an excellent part. And, you know, obviously, depending on where you used to play, the, the enormity of it would, um, of, the, of the, the match would sort of be, could be one, or, you know, sort of grown quite big, or, or you sort of fade into a bit of um, a anonymity. So, you know, for example, in New Zealand, where rugby is sort of the be all and end all for the for the country, you know, you, you're very there's not much escaping of the public. You know, when you're there for weeks at a time or a week, you know that people know who you are, they know what's going on, and they, you know, you, you you're very well aware that people are understanding. But, you know, on the flip side, if you're say here in London uh, and you're out playing, you know, you're here playing the English, you know, it, it you know, it, it was quite easy to, to blend into the backdrop and, you know, sort of no one seems too fussed because there's so many people and so much going on. It's, um, it's not that uh, positive. So look, I think 
it would have an impact, but you know, I think that's the beauty of it, and I think you need to embrace it rather than shy away from it. I think it's, um, you know, it's great that people support their team so passionately. Um, that's what sports about. That's what brings it. You know, that's what um, you know brings brings out of people. Sport does in, in in a way that I don't think not many other things can, and uh, and I think it should be should be you know celebrated rather than uh, shied away from. Absolutely. Now, another thing with leadership, you know, you led, like we talked about as captain, but another really great quality of a leader is being able to be led. Uh, what was the relationship with coaches like for you, you know, people like Robbie Deans? How do you manage that relationship as well as you're leading? Yeah, look, I think it's important to, you know, be pretty well aligned with the coach as the captain, because in the end, you are one of the conduits between, I guess, a playing group and a, and a coaching staff and, and the, the direction you want to take. And, and I think it's important to be, make sure that you're able to have everything aligned, um, you know, in the end, because, you know, the coach ultimately makes the, makes the final decision before the game, but on the field, that's where, you know, the captain and the, and the team leaders take over. And, uh, you know, it's if you're aligned during the week and the way it's sort of set up, it, that's the important part of, um, making sure that you know you're successful, you know, on the match day. So I think it's about you know I was very lucky. We had some great coaches that I worked with over time, and you know, it, you know, it was always making sure that you were aligned and tried to um, have as many non-formal conversations as possible, just to sort of understand where we're where we sit and where we're getting to. Right now, as I mentioned before. Clearly, this is a tough sport. It's not for the faint of heart. Now, what would a typical training week or training day look like for someone playing such a tough sport? Uh, look, it, uh, it sort of depends on on the um, the when the matches are, because obviously the right. days you, you sort of work back from when you're or work you know past the previous the, the 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 fixture before, so you sort of have. You know, usually the day after a game would be a rest day. Right. Um, you know, a week, you know, Monday would be very much about a recovery. Um, you know, you do get do a lot of lot of gym work on on a, on a Monday, but it would be more about recovery, review, you know, going through film, going through what happened on the weekend, reviewing what, you know, individual team, you know, specific group performances from that fixture and also looking ahead at the, the week and then you'd have a, a lightish training session usually that afternoon to to sort of flush the legs out a little bit more so than anything rather than having too much uh trying to get too many k's you know tuesday and wednesday are usually your big days depending on your week structure you know usually there's a there's a week there's a day uh, a down day on the week where you're off feet so you're not you're not on field so tuesday traditionally is your your double day um you know where you do a big unit sort of beat the crap out of each other in the morning as a forward and then in the afternoon have a big team session you know with weights in there as well so that's your that's your big work day usually for the week and Wednesday's a down day where you again recovery um, watch film watch review training that sort of thing with Thursday being more of a, a fast day so you're not as you know you'll do things very fast but your recovery in between sets will be greater um, than what it was on a Tuesday, the less more sort of anaerobic conditioning. So you do, you know, sets. You work for a period of time, stop, and then you know have a have a longer break, walk back, and go through and, and sort of get your confidence. In, you know, and then also included on that day would be some f form of weights and prehab, rehab, and then Friday is just sort of a, a fine tune up usually. So depending on where you're playing, sometimes you travel to the venue if you have to depending on where whereabouts in the world you are. So you'd either travel Thursday night or Friday morning and then do a, you know, sort of a run around at the stadium, a bit bit more than a jog through, but just to sort of fine tune, go through the any sort of fine little preparations you had and tweak anything. And, you know, a lot of different guys with, you know, specialty skills, you know, like kickers and goal kickers and things like that would, you know, just get acclimatised to the, to the ground and, what have you, and then Saturday you do it all again, and then the week starts again. So that's that's a basic sort of rough week, and it obviously changes depending on uh, who the coach is. But that's sort of a, a broader outline of what a week would look like. Wow, 
amazing. It, in that you spoke about recovery and that's something that you had, a, had to do a lot, recovery, especially when it came to injuries and rehab, just so the audience has a, a perspective. 2005, you had a shoulder reconstruction. 2008, you had screws put in your foot. 2009, you had a toe operation. 2010, you had full knee reconstruction. And 2012, you snapped your hamstring completely in half. I mean, this is probably just some of the stuff that you've been through. Like, what drives you? Because most of that, like one of those things would probably take a person out. What drives you to keep going? What drives, what drove you? Uh, look, yeah, look, I mean, I guess one of the downsides of the sport is that um, injuries are part of it. Um, and I certainly had my fair share. Uh, but look, I think for me, it was more about, you know, wanting to compete and get back and play because I, I genuinely love the sport and, and, and that's what I wanted to do. And um, look, there were some long roads there. There were you know, a couple of those injuries took sort of, you know, 11 plus months to recover from to get back playing. And, you know, it is a very slow process of, you know, getting through to, you know, teaching your body to walk again and then building yourself up to to playing uh, elite level rugby and elite level sports. So, look, yeah, it's a, it's a very much a slow process. And I think, you know, the, the, the end goal is always there to get back playing. And that was always, for me, I knew that was the goal and, I, you know, at the very beginning I didn't really have to revisit it. It was just about, you know, I want to, that's what I want to do. I want to get back playing. And then it was more about, again, the process of, you know, setting, you know, little micro goals each week. You know, as I said, like one of them was to learn to walk again, you know, strength goals of your, of your leg, things like that to try and set targets to hit. And then when you set your target, hit your target, you move on to the next target. And I think that was um, something that, you know, I, I tried to do and I, you know, and also attached to that, I, I, I used to probably drive my physios and S&C coaches nuts, but I used to like get a, a fairly clear, detailed plan about exactly what I was doing on exact days. And so I knew what I was trying to get into and what I had to tick off. And um, that was always very, uh, very helpful for me. I think that's really important that you mention that because a lot of athletes especially for people who are coming into sport, they don't really understand, you know, some of these major things that will set you back. Like to be out of your sport for 11 months is a big deal. And mentally managing that during that period of time can be really challenging. So I think other people hearing you say, you know, you may have driven your physios and doctors mad, but mm. you made sure you had a plan and you just chip, chip, chip away at it. Were there any moments where you really wondered whether, any of these injuries were it like you wouldn't be able to come back from that and how did you how did you push through that uh yeah there was there was a couple particularly around my hamstring injury it was um mm. it was quite a unique injury um that uh caused a few issues um due to due to some other complications um that i'd had through pre other injuries on that on that limb uh and look there was a period of time there that we probably um had the conversations well you know not not had but we you know those conversations were that you know if we can't get through this period and, and it keeps happening then you know it might meet be meaning you know in no no in certain terms that you might not be able to do what you want to do again so look i have certainly had that period and, and look it's not a not a not a nice period um to go through particularly at a, at a younger youngish age um, but look, I think for me to mentally get through it, it was just, again, the sort of the dogged determination that it was, you know, you were going to make it work and, you know, you probably can ask my wife, I'm a fairly stubborn person, um, when it comes to, to things. And, you know, it, I guess that was my, my mindset. It was just, I wasn't going to let this happen, uh, to me, uh, from that aspect. And, you know, we're, you sort of just go back to go forward a little bit, which might be the, um, you know, in a, in a sort of very generalist sort of term, you sort of go back and simplify things from a from an aspect of the injury and, and then work your way back up again. And, and we did that and, um, you know, found a way to, to manage it. And, you know, I, I had to manage it for the rest of my career, but I was, um, yeah, quite lucky that, it, you know, it worked out in the end. Nice. Now, mental toughness is definitely a quality, obviously, that any athlete needs to be successful. Do you think there are qualities that athletes need 
to be successful that can't really be taught? Um, yeah, there's a, there's a, there has to be an element of sort of resilience or determination to, to, to achieve because if it was easy, everyone would do it. Um, look, I think you have to, you know, when we sort of, you know, a, a lot of people sort of talk about um, sacrifices and things like that, I, I sort of look at it a little bit differently because in the end it, it's a choice and you have a choice whether you want to do it or not. Um, and if you choose not to do it, then, you know, you're probably not going to be successful. You know, sacrifice it. The people that made sacrifices to me, for me, were my, my, my family, my wife. You know, they, they, it wasn't their choice. They sacrificed things so I could be successful. Uh, for me, it was a choice. And I think you have to weigh up the, the choices that you have in life and, and choose which way you want to go. And, and I think that's, you know, if, you, if that's the choice that you make and you're going to commit to it, then that that's the important way to go, and I think that's um, you know when you're looking at mental toughness and resilience, you know that that's an that's an obvious trait, you know, and it's probably more uh, exposed in the sense of um, you know it's quite easy to see in in you know particularly in sports, it's you know it's about you know doing the extra training, it, you know it's a, a lot of it's physical. You know, more so. Ment there's a lot of mental stuff now, but a lot of it's physical training to to get you into the shape to compete at the top level. Um, and I think that it's about choosing to do that. Um, and I think that's the important part. And if you if you end up doing that, then sort of toughness and men mental toughness and resilience, it, you know, comes hand in hand. Right. Absolutely. Another thing that athletes have to deal with a lot is loss. It doesn't matter who you are, how talented you are, where you come from. At some point, you're going to have to deal with losing a game, losing a race, whatever the case may be. How did you manage that? Because I've seen all sorts of things across the spectrum, people totally going into depression. I've seen people kind of just brush it off. Where were you at and how did you manage losses in your sport? Uh, I Yeah, I, I did, didn't like losing. I don't like losing. Um, and that was probably... Something that, um, you know, I guess wasn't, you know, I, you know, in hindsight, you know, I probably didn't handle some of these that well, but, it, you know, I used to take it very personally about losing and it used to, you know, I was, you know, we're going into depression is probably a bit, you know, a bit, a bit extreme. I wouldn't say that, but, I, you know, I, I used to really take it personally and, and I used to, you know, I, I generally hate losing. And, um, you know, sometimes even when, you know, you'd ask questions about what could you have done better, and that was always the thing for me. You know, as long make sure that you could do as much as you possibly can to help the team win, and I think that's the um, for me that was the important part. Um, but yeah, look, in terms of being, um, uh, you know, in, in dealing with loss, um, I wouldn't say I dealt with it that well <laughs> at times, but you know, it was more about. You know, deal. You know, I was always tried to be, and not always successfully, try and sort of deal with it for a period of time, and then once that time's over, then move on. Right. Um, and sometimes that was easier said than done. You know, you know, you give yourself an evening or a day to sort of kick cans and walk around with your head down for a bit. But you know, once that period's done, you got to move on. And I guess in professional sport, particularly team sport and rugby, where it's a very full calendar. Uh, you were quite lucky most of the time you had a um, you had something like the following week to prepare for so by Monday you, you had to shift your focus and that was that always did a you know allow me to to move on you know it was always you know whether you were playing for your you know your club or your provincial side and then you know even if that finished you're on to the next bit you got the international game so you got to prepare for them so you folk your focus shifts so that was always a you know, subconsciously or consciously a benefit of of playing sport is that, you know, while you're down and in the dumps and hating losing, that you know, you quickly had to shift on to the next job because that was the that was the important part. Right. Do you think that disdain for losing is part of what made you greater? Uh possibly. I mean you probably have to ask others that, but yeah, certainly I you know, I, I very competitive as a you know, no matter what I did, and that was always something that I, you know, I hated losing. Um, even if you were, you knew you weren't 
the, the, the better team on the day. You know, I, I probably as I got older, I, I got to deal with it a little bit better, but still um, that was probably more so in, in showing it. You know, I, I used to probably, you know, I wasn't, I'm not a great poker player. You know, I find it quite hard to sort of hide your emotions and things right. like this. So if I was disappointed or upset, um, it was quite easy. You know, it was quite evident. Uh, and probably as as time went on, as I matured as a person, I, I probably got to managing it that better public, you know, from a, as an outward sense, not publicly is probably a wrong word, but, you know, from an outward sense for other people. But, um, you know, for sure, internally, that the fire was still there burning and driving and um, frustrating me. Right. Speaking of difficult times, uh, sadly, 2017, you lost someone who you considered a friend, a mentor, someone who you looked up to, who advised you a lot, Daniel Vickerman. How, what was his life, what impact did his life have on you as a player, as a man? What did that whole experience um, bring to you uh, in moving forward, not only in your career, but just as a human? Oh, look, I think Vix was always a guy that, um, you know, I, I didn't, I played a, a little bit with him. I didn't play a lot with him compared to others. He was, a, he was sort of a little bit older than I, and I was lucky enough to play a couple of seasons uh, at international level with him, but he was always a, a strong competitor. And, you know, it was, um, I think that, uh, you know, obviously him passing away and taking his own life probably sort of rammed home the point to a lot of people, not, not just me, that, you know, it, it's, you know, while things on the surface can seem great, it's um, there's obviously things that, that you know that mental health is a real thing and it, and it needs to be looked after. And you know, uh, particularly in the transition from professional sport to the, you know the you know say quasi say the the real world um, is a is a is a difficult one. Um, no matter what you do or what how you prepared yourself, you know, he was someone that had prepared himself. You, from the from the outside, you'd, you'd imagine very well, um, but you know, obviously, was a you know from internally had some um, had some you know some demons that that he couldn't um, you know that unfortunately got the better of him, and you know you know it's a tr it's such a tragic situation for his wife and, and young boys, and um, you know something that he uh, you know I think he's le left a lasting legacy you know amongst the, the people he's played with. Um, but you know, obviously, that you know, it, it shows that there is, um, you know, you got to pay special attention to your life once once the sport finishes because it it is a change. It is a the transition can be a difficult one, and it's something that um, yeah is important to to acknowledge that. And so when you move forward, it's uh, you can deal with it better. Yeah, absolutely. I had my own experiences with that as well. Do you think that? Now, as retired athletes, myself, yourself, other retired athletes, do you think there's more that we and the sport can do? And if so, what, what do you think we could do to sort of help the next generation not have to go through those same types of struggles? Uh, look, I, I definitely think that sport can, you know, particularly rugby, the sport that I'm from, can do a lot more um, in preparing uh, people for for post career, um, mm -hmm. you know, look, it, it's a it's a catch twenty two. You know, it's a difficult situation in the fact that a lot of clubs, you know, that you're there, you're only there for a short time. You want to prepare, you want to do maximize your time in the uh, as an athlete to get the most out of what you do. But also, I think it needs to be sort of a fit, sort of made in the sense that to give time to to encourage people to do things and and get out and experience the world to find out what they do so they're prepared that you know when they when they when they do finish and that's the I guess the thing about professional sports no matter how you know particularly sports we play unless you play golf right. or something similar you know the the ability uh, there there's an end point you know it's not like you know if you're you're an accountant or a lawyer you know you you can do that for 30 40 years until you mm -hmm. do, you decide to retire but uh, there is some point where the you know you you uh, acknowledge that yourself and, and make the decision, or your body uh, makes the decision for you and tells you that you can't keep doing what you're doing. And I think that's with professional sports it is a unique part. Of it. I mean, it is a short lifespan, and it's only part of your life. It's not all of your life. And I think that's the important distinction to make for a lot of people in the in the leagues at the moment. 
you know, and I think definitely sport in general can do more to prepare athletes for um, post career because it is it is a it is a change. Right, absolutely. You made that change in 2019. You decided to retire from professional rugby after 14 years. How did you know it was time? Uh, look, I just probably had enough. I, I, I had had a lot of, you know, as we touched on earlier, I had a lot of injuries um, and I started getting a lot of niggling injuries and really was really struggling to mm. put together games. And, you know, there was nothing that big that did that, but it was just more my mindset of, um, you know, I, I'd had a, I, I'd probably mentally had enough to keep pushing myself to where I wanted to be, and I, I didn't think I could give the level that I wanted to give uh, as a player. Um, you know, in the preparation and and on the match day, and it, you know, I felt that was starting to wane. So, I, you know, for me, it was about you know making that decision and and I guess doing it on your own terms rather than yeah. being forced to do it for, through injury or, or vice versa. So. Look, that was for me the the decision I made, and um, yeah, look, it was uh, look in, in hindsight, you, you do miss it. it at times. You know, you miss you know they miss the games and the camaraderie of of the team, but you know, there, there's part there's definitely parts that I don't miss whatsoever. Um, <laughs> and you know, I'm had I'm I'm, fu- I'm glad I'm on the other side of the fence. Right, I hear that. Now, Queensland Rugby CEO Jim Carmichael said that after you retired, he said that you were one of the great modern day sporting treasures of <laughs> Queensland. After everything you put into the sport, what's it like to hear yourself being recognised in that way? Oh, look, yeah, I, I mean, that's probably a, probably a bit of a stretch from Jim there. But look, you know, <laughs> it's very kind. Um, you know, I was always, you know, I was very lucky to play for as long as I did. Um, and I was very lucky to, you know, play for, you know, as we touched on earlier, my, you know, my my team, my hometown team, the Reds, for so long, and, and be such a big part of them. And then obviously, captain my country, captain the Reds, and you know, when I came over here to the UK to play for Harlequins, captain Harlequins as well. So, you know, I, I feel very privileged and lucky to to have been a part of those, those great places. And yeah, it's something that I'll. I'll you know, always treasure and, and hold dear and, you know, something that will always, always stay with me. When you did the final kick, the final game of your career, was was it emotional or did, was it kind of like, yes, finally going to have some rest? Uh, oh, look, it's a bit of, it's always a bit emotional. It's, you know, it's, yeah. a, you know, I spent 15 years playing and, you know, the, as I said, the, the team aspect of it, the camaraderie that you have is, you know, what you miss the most and, you know, it's a um, yeah. Any sort of change can bring on a, a bunch of emotions, but you know, look, I, I always said I, I genuinely loved playing and what I, you know, playing the sport and being a being a rugby player for as long as I was. It was something that I was very lucky, as I said before, I was very lucky to be able to do for so long. Um, and yeah, look, you know, the emotions. I'm you know, most people that you'd speak to that I play with probably say I'm a fairly emotional guy and. Um, yeah, look, there were parts that was emotional and there's also parts, I think, as I say, looking back now that I'm glad I don't have to keep doing uh, what the guys are doing at the moment. Right. Now, you've got a scholarship to Cambridge University. Tell us what's that about? Uh, yeah, look, I got a, a bit of a bursary. To, uh, you know, I'm currently in, in the final part of my um, – I'm doing an MBA here at the Cambridge Judge Business School. Um, wow. So we're in the last three months of that. So I, I started that uh, once I retired from from rugby, which was something I'd, I'd wanted to do. Uh, I wanted to sort of, I guess, understand my, you know business a little bit better. Uh, and you know, while I've got some some unique skill sets, it was more to get and you know improve my business acumen and understand. And you know, I guess maybe put a you know a couple of letters behind your name that sort of gave you a bit more clout. You know, when you when you're dealing in business and so forth, that you know that um, you have the ability to to you know function on on that level. You know, after playing professional sport for a long time. So look, yeah, I've been very lucky to be part of Cambridge University, which is an amazing place. Although COVID sort of uh, hampered the 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 whole ex- the Cambridge experience a little bit, mm-hmm. as a lot of our um, lessons are all online via Zoom mm-hmm. and so forth. So it's um, but yeah, look, I'm um, yeah, enjoy the experience, and we're we're in the, the final throes of it at the moment. 
Nice. Now they managed to get you to pop out of retirement for a little bit there and you helped them win. Was it was it like before or did it feel a bit different coming out of retirement for that? Oh yeah, look, I played in, you know, a very historic game, which is the varsity match between uh, Cambridge University and Oxford University, which is, you know, one of the oldest fixtures um, in, in rugby and something that I was, you know, keen to be a part of and very lucky to be a part of um, for you know, as a as a as a player, you know, it's probably shifted a little bit to what it used to be. It used to be, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, back in the amateur days, it was sort of considered as a, a bit of a an international trial of of sorts. But yeah, look, it was um, sort of took me back to my days when I finished high school and you know, playing varsity rugby back in Brisbane. Uh, it sort of gave me that sort of appreciation. It was very much amateur and lucky to be a part of it, and glad we got the win. And you know, um, you know, it's sort of that that box that I've been able to tick. Uh, as part of my career love it now through your whole career everything you've experienced like you said 15 years in the game what would you say was the moment that you treasured most out of your entire career um you know i, I enjoyed all of it but i think the the probably the mo the games or the moments you know was winning the super rugby title with the queensland reds um right. as as captain that was something that's always going to stay with me you know um you know as, as i said as a brisbane boy born and raised in queensland um you know and, and the journey we were, i was able to help the team go on that year um and be a part of was was something that i'll always hold very dear and you know the the fact that we were able to win at our home stadium in front of a you know a massive crowd um is something that that will always i will always treasure um you know no matter you know where how old I get, and something that was always very important and special to me. Amazing. Now we talked a little bit about life after rugby. How well do you think that you prepared for life after rugby, and and what are you up to now? What's your plans for the future now? Uh, look, it's. I think you can always prepare better. You know, I probably considered that. Uh, you know, in, in hindsight, I probably uh, should have done a few more things to to prepare myself. Um, but I'm very lucky. I've got. I've had some time, and I guess that's where I've had the the trip. Be able to transition and using the the course to be able to do that. So that's always something that I've um, been very lucky to be able to do. Um, you know, where the future holds, I'm not sure. We're moving, going to move back to Australia um, once mm -hmm. the course is finished, um, and so that that'll be exciting for for me and the family. And, and then we'll see where we get to from there. But um, world's my oyster a little bit which is which is exciting but uh, anxious nonetheless so for people coming up in the sport now just brand new with everything all the knowledge and wisdom that you have now looking back what advice would you give them in order to get through the sport but then also like you said transition well after what what type of advice would you want them to have oh look i think sorry it's okay. what's going on? um I I would probably say that, you know, make the most of the opportunities you get while you're playing and, and commit yourself completely to it. But also you, it, with professional sport, due to the recovery aspect, you do get a lot of downtime. So utilise that downtime as much as possible to prepare yourself for life after sport. And that should start um, as soon as you possibly can. So I think that, you know, from a young age, you know, you when you're you know 18 19 20 as you're coming in you should you shouldn't be thinking oh you know i'll do it when i'm a bit older when it's getting closer that that's the the right time to start preparing start exposing yourself whether it's through degrees or uh university or even exposing yourself to different things you know spend a half a day a week with you know at a, at a different job to see if that's something that you could be interested post rugby um or post the sport so i think that's an important part of um of doing it and something that i probably should have done a little bit more of but you know expose yourself you know and you're very lucky sport opens doors to places that a lot of people can't um yeah. can't get a hold of and, and you're able to get opportunities and people you know people like to help um and so i think that's something that i would recommend you know even as i said even if it's free just trailing a couple of people at work and seeing what they do and how they do it and seeing where they go you know what that could be something i could look into a bit more it can be literally as basic as that it takes half a day a week um and i think that that could serve you in good stead come whenever it is you decide to finish absolutely fantastic advice 
Before I go, before I wrap up, I always like to have a little fun with my guests. I hope you don't mind. It's going to play a game. It's called This or That. I'm just going to say two things. You just pick one or the other. You cool with that? Yeah. Yeah, sure. No worries. (laughs) All right. So first game or final game? First game. Android or iPhone? iPhone. Studying the game or studying for your master's at Cambridge? Uh, the game. Mental toughness or physical toughness? Uh, physical toughness, probably. <laughs> I understand that. Last question. What do you want the world to know? Um, what do I want the world to know? I don't know. Um, I've never really been asked that. That's a good question. I don't actually know. Um, yeah. Enjoy yourself and and don't take yourself too seriously. Amen to that. (laughs) Now, if people want to catch up with you or I don't know if you're on social media or if you have business stuff going on, but is there a way they can follow you or find out what you're up to? Yeah, on all social media. So on Instagram and Twitter, I'm at Jay Horwell. uh, And if you want to connect on LinkedIn, it's just James Horwell. um, And yeah, it'd be good to connect on that. So all those three platforms, reach out, happy to have a chat. Uh, and keen to find out what more people are doing. Always very interested uh, to hear what others are up to. Absolutely. Well, we are really appreciative that you took the time to spend with us, especially when you've got plenty of other things you could be doing, like family and studies. So just want to say thank you and good luck to you and your family on your next chapter in life and hope it all goes wonderfully well. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Tasha. Thank you. No problem. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Such a cool, calm and collected chap, but he has achieved so much. And I think he's a great role model for anyone, not just in rugby, but for anyone coming up in sports to really understand how to go through your career, not just by what he experienced, but by what he's learned and the lessons he's now passing on. So even if you don't get it right during your career, it's important to then go back and, you know, give advice to others. Like he said, he would have done more things to advance his career after sports if he was to go back now. And he's passing on that message. So uh, what a wonderful individual. And we wish him all the best. Now, remember to like, share, follow and subscribe. And don't forget, if you're on YouTube, you've got to hit that little bell, hit that bell. It will remind you. It will let you know when a new show has been posted, all right? And comment. Comment on on what you felt was the most, you know, the thing that he said that really got you thinking, right? So we love to engage. We love to communicate with you. Don't forget to go to www.globalsportschannel.com. There's so much more there, (laughs) all right? Anyway, that's all from me for now. So, ciao.